so welcome everybody to uh, the I2B2 uh, annual uh, academic users group meeting here in Boston. Um, I'm really uh, excited to see all of you and even more excited to see that half of you are new. Um, I want, before I go forward into the talk, I really have to make sure I thank the right people because uh, otherwise I'll forget. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Rudy for all his organizational uh, capacity with for the foundation and for this meeting, but most of all, I'd like to thank Diane Keogh. Diane uh, did an amazing amount of work to bring, as you'll learn later during the day, our foundation into great shape as we unite the two, uh, the two organizations, Transmart and I2B2. And she also brought uh, a great program uh, for us to share uh, today. So um, I think that you should know that without her, we wouldn't have anything like this today. So first of all, let's give a big hand to Diane. All right, so uh, um, let's see if I can run this way. Nine years ago, I was at a eMERGE meeting. So eMERGE is a very uh, useful uh, collection of hospitals in the United States that use electronic health records to join uh, clinical data and deep phenotyping to uh, genomic data most often obtained from discarded samples. So it's a way, the Emerge Network is a way of looking at entire healthcare systems and doing genomics very cheaply on it. Um, I will claim with some narcissism that we here in I2B2 at Harvard pioneered a lot of those techniques using natural language processing and some of the phenotyping that we'd showed around rheumatoid arthritis and um, asthma and uh, a variety of other common diseases back in the early 2000s. And I was at a meeting of this Emerge Network and I heard from uh, the, someone at Geisinger, and Geisinger, if you don't know, is one of the leaders, in my opinion, of using uh, electronic health record data to find interesting patients, to um, sequence them, to find new discoveries. And they have this amazing partnership with a drug company, Regenron, which provides essentially the costs of sequencing and a lot of the costs of analysis. And it's been great both for Geisinger and for Regeneron. But I remember at the time hearing Mark Williams, when I asked him, I asked him, so you really need a lot of genetic information. How about family history? How about storing the genetics in the electronic health record? And he said, uh, I think we've got that covered. I think it was eight or nine years ago. He said, I think we got that, we have that covered. Uh, Epic tells us that we'll have it done in two years. Of course, uh, nine years later, Epic still doesn't have it covered. And so there is still no good way, and I don't want to pick on Epic because it's true of all the major electronic health record vendors, there is no good way to store um, genomic information. There is no good way to display genomic information. There is no good way to obtain a family history, to use a family history to inform decision-making. And so whereas we were able to have splashy headlines uh, 17 years ago about the human genome and how it's going to affect healthcare, we still have, have not used it yet in a, in a regular process of care, not least of which because it's not part of our process automation. And if we were to wait for the major healthcare IT vendors to do this, I think we could wait a very long time. But I'm here to tell you that we don't, and there's lots of reason for optimism, and many of them come from this platform that we all are working on. Let me try to motivate, motivate that for you. Let me start by telling you about a very successful project that I've had the honor to be involved in. It's called the Undiagnosed Disease Network. By the way, Diane, I'm, I'm actually counting on you to give me a five-minute warning. 
um, because I, I can I'm being to see that I'm sort of falling in love with this topic as I go along, so it could go along. Um, so it started as a program at NIH, the Undiagnosed Disease Program, where in the NIH they were seeing patients who had been undiagnosed for years, suffering, really suffering, dying, suffering. And they were able to make, depending on how you read their reports, meaningful diagnoses from between 40 to 60 percent of the patients that they saw, just in quotes, by getting exome sequencing. This was early on, like 2008, and referring the patients to the right expert in the NIH um, health system. And so what happened is constituents from all over the United States went to their congressmen and said, how come NIH is not seeing me? I'm suffering. I'm undiagnosed. And NIH talked, uh, and the congressman, Republican and Democrat, went to NIH and said, how come you're not seeing our patients? And they said, we don't have the bandwidth. So it was remarkable at the time. It was complete bipartisan support. I mean, very fast bipartisan support because every congressperson was hearing from their constituents. Let's make this a national program. So they took the undiagnosed disease program and blew it up to a quarter billion dollar national program. And the sites that were awarded, the clinical sites that were awarded are shown here on the uh, slide. So you see here uh, that we have West Coast sites, um, uh, East Coast sites, some in the middle, and the NIH. And I want to point out a few things here. Some of these are, are academic health centers. Some of them are federal uh, academic centers, such as specifically the NIH. And what they funded first was the uh, coordinating center. And along with uh, some of my colleagues here, I'm the principal investigator of the coordinating center. They funded us first because we had to bring the, the, the network together. And I think we were funded because we proposed something quite radical. Typically, coordinating centers are just sort of pushing people around and getting them to go to meetings and write reports. What I suggested was as a coordinating center, we're going to take all the data from these patients, all the data, genomic data, and all the clinical data identified, and shove it into the cloud and have it shared across all these academic health centers. Now, that was a high-risk idea at the time when I, we proposed it, which was about six years ago. But I'll give credit to the reviewers. They thought it was the right idea. And so what happened is, is we stood up that whole infrastructure in one year after we were funded. The whole infrastructure, cloud-hosted. And since then, in the four years, we received two, 2300 applica over 2,300 applications. This is out of date over 2,300 applications. And we've seen across the network, a thousand individuals suffering. And we have, and this is definitely out of date, over 200 individuals for which we have new meaningful diagnoses, either a new genetic, a new disease, complete new disease with a new uh, gene involved or a new combination of uh, findings around Genes previously involved, but not those particular um, mutations. And so how did this happen? So what we did is we first said, we're gonna, if you want to be funded, you're going to have to put all your data in the cloud. And your IRB is going to have to agree to that. If your IRB doesn't agree, you don't have to play. Give NIH its money back. And we were quite uh, strict about it. So guess what? Within one year, every IRB had agreed to, to this. S second, we said if the patient is admitted to the system, and the way the patient admits, you apply through the, the gateway, which we host out of Harvard Medical School. By the way, for those who don't know this complex ecosystem here in Boston, Harvard Medical School has zero patients and does not own any hospitals. And so, um, we have this website up, and what happens is these patients, all the data gets uploaded, and then there's a group that meets together virtually across all these centers, and we decide who gets admitted into the program. 
who has a good shot at getting, getting a meaningful diagnosis. And then the data gets dispersed so that when the patient shows up, they're there with their genomic data and their clinical data. Now, I want to ask you, how often does it happen in the rest of the world, first world, that when you go to the doctor, all your data shows up with you? But it does happen here. And not only that, we said there's no intellectual property stickers. The patient does not belong to you. If the patient gets referred from Nashville to Palo Alto, that's fine. Intellectual property doesn't flow back to the referring center. And it's been extremely successful, as I mentioned. And we had to do a lot to make it happen. So for example, we didn't have to, but in order to make sure everybody was comfortable, we made sure that we could actually sign uh, HIPAA certification agreements for this cloud implementation, which we were able to do early on uh, because, and I think I'll let um, Paul Aviak, who's done a lot of the heavy lifting here, um, along with Suzanne Churchill, I'll let them tell you, tell you about all the different cloud vendors who've been involved but I'll tell you that Amazon was probably, not probably, was certainly the first in being able to obtain the right kind of certification. More complicated, if you're involving federal data, you have to adhere to a federal standard of data security called FISMA, which I'd never heard of. Uh, but we had to because this was federal data because these were NIH seen patients. And again, we went through the complicated and somewhat expensive process of getting audited to make sure we were FISMA certified. But again, we were able to. So now you actually have a national network that shares genomic data, clinical data, and is able to share that at the, at the national scale in a FISMA HIPAA compliant environment. So what are the features and what are the challenges? So first of all, features. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but among the most lucrative and easy places to get personalized healthcare data is from hospitals, from hospital IT systems. And it used to be that when I would talk about cloud hosting, people would come back to me and say, Zach, why would you want to do that? It's so much safer when it's in the hospital environment. And there's a number of reasons why that is wrong. Reason number one, and probably the most important reason is if you're Amazon or Google compared to your user base which is millions of customers paying billions of dollars you can afford to have a team a security team in the hundreds and the number of FTEs per a thousand users is a tiny fraction but if you're in a hospital to have two security people is a huge luxury or paying much more per capita than, um, than Amazon or Google. And with only two people, it's very hard to keep up with all the uh, different driver uh, and system uh, updates. And furthermore, we have proof through all the massive hacking attempts that we have not actually kept up. And there's been multiple uh, thefts of data from these systems. And they're very lucrative because if you want to do spear phishing, that is when someone calls you up and say, oh, your cousin Joe is in, is in, is in a uh, pickle and he needs uh, you to wire $1,000 to get him out of jail, that data does not come out of a credit card uh, profile. But if you have your entire health record, we know a lot about you. We know your cousin Joe has diabetes. We know that uh, Auntie Jill had cancer. And so the price on the dark market of uh, a record uh, from a credit card is cents per, per person. It's well over a dollar to tens of dollars for health data. Um, another uh, feature is, is that it makes sharing super easy. If it's behind a hospital firewall, then you have to deal with Particular, uh, particularities of that firewall. There is firewalls and firewall rules for all the cloud vendors, 
but that you can make them scaled and uniform across the country or the world. What are the challenges? Uh, the challenges are that hardware is paid typically out of capital budget. So if you're a researcher or a hospital, you say, okay, I bought this hardware to host my data, and now I don't have to worry about it until it becomes obsolete, which sometimes is as long as a CIO's, I mean, a CIO's average duration of tenure is three years or less. The depreciation of hardware is about three years. So if you buy the hardware, then you'll never have to worry about in your tenure again. But if you go with cloud computing, it's not out of your um, capital budget, it's out of your operating budget. And you keep having, getting bills every month. And although it's dem demonstrable that probably when, you, it's, when it's all in, in terms of personnel and so on, the cloud hosting is less expensive, as a CIO, you still will see those monthly bills out of operating, and it just fiscally harder under current accounting slash politics of uh, budgeting. And we can discuss that if we want to uh, going forward. Um, so, whoops. So, by the way, what is undiagnosed? So it's a medical condition or problem not being identified. And it turns out that it's not only the rare diseases. And by the way, even the rare, so-called rare undiagnosed diseases are uh, in aggregate three to 4% of the population. But if you look more closely at the common diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, diabetes, depression, large chunks of those diseases actually do not respond to standard of care therapy. And typically when we see that, we just say, eh, the drug didn't work. Much more rarely do we say, maybe it's not the disease that we think it is. But as we're actually beginning to come closer to these diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, and you start studying these families which have inflammatory bowel disease and are not responding to the treatment, you start unearthing different genetics, different exposures, different diet. They are looking like different diseases. And seeing these large data sets are very helpful to do so. And trying to find more patients like these is also very important. And so we have used the Twitter and uh, the Facebook to try to find such patients, of course, with patient consent. And it's been moderately, but only moderately uh, successful. And what's fascinating is look at this patient, has all these hashtags. So we looked at another database that we've actually poured into I2B2, which Griffin might tell you about. And it has 60 million patients. Griffin, are you here? How many rows does it have, the, uh, the uh, Aetna one? 12 billion rows. And, and it, if you just do the principal component analysis of what are the diseases, you can see basically there's a big chunk of neuropsych diseases, a big chunk of renal failure diseases, a big chunk of uh, cardiometabolic uh, diseases. But if you take the hashtags from that patient, if you take that hashtag from the patient, there's one patient who's at this intersection of all those hashtags. In fact, this patient, when we looked at it, this patient, in this database. And you see all these different, I hate non-Macs. Anyway, um, you look at all their uh, characteristics, all their claims. They look identical to the patient we were trying to match on that uh, Twitter thing. So much so that I thought it was the same patient because it's a national database. But the gender is flipped and the age is off by one. And so now we're working with Aetna to be able to use this data to reach back to the doctor of that patient to, to see if the patient is willing to be consented to join the UDM protocol and be able to rapidly go to, through to ITB2 to, to be able to find these patients is key. Now I'm going to show a video and I guess because this is a PC that I have no audio. Is that right? 
square. Oh, and damn it. Um, hmm. Let's see. Paul, are you here? I want to show your video. Uh, um, the, the, um, the UDN one. Would you be able to navigate it to from here from the from uh, oh there it is holy smokes wow it actually worked how do you make sound on this thing okay so I will do I'll, I can't do the French accent but I'll do polls. Uh what we see here is uh, a precision medicine uh, I can I don't know what accent that is it's not French um, is a precision medicine stack, multimodal stack. Is it still running? Yes. It's a multimodal stack. We're looking at different data types. And Paul will have demonstrated for us how he uses I2B2 for the undiagnosed disease network to be able to bring together all these data types where no sale oncology is adequate. And you need genomics as well. So here's a case uh, who has this currently connected tissue disease and has all these other findings. And you could classify this person by ICNI or by HPO, the human phenotype ontology. And patient uh, also has a, a mutation in this particular uh, gene. All right. And so Paul is now looking, connecting. Uh, oh, what, 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 you want to here. So we're going to uh, our genome uh, platform that we keep talking about. We did a couple of working spaces where we had the people that are in this task and we are able to go using the genome to be able to analyze and find the report for these patients. So this is analyzing this trigger with this province and this yet. So that's what fully is increased is in most habits to then be able to filter and find the potential variants of interest. So you have here one line for variants with, uh, and to be able to find there's 72 variants that were of interest potentially uh, being pathogenic uh, using a uh, non synonymous impact in the RevSeq uh, Rev model. And then to be able to narrow it down and in a few seconds, in a few clicks, without writing a line of code, to be able to discover and find which was the gene and which mutation was affected for this individual. So this is part of integrating all the different stack layers of stacks. So this is an example of it was a genotype two genotype. Now it's other way around. When now looking at the uh, IQ2 transplant genotypes, where you have looking at the population where the huge advantage of the UDA, where you have all the rare patients being integrated into one single place, 900 patients with all the rare diagnosis. Now, to select all the patients that are in common of, of uh, having the, uh, it's difficult to talk when I'm not doing it. <laughs> you think it's easy? It's yeah, basically so, worse yeah, for me. And the, the whole concept of using the, the power of the IP model is to have all the Layers of information. These are all the clinical data, the gene example, the data, the sequence of data. So, look, he has ontologies that are about things that are important here, but important nowhere else, like the clinical site, where it came from. He has ontologies about ICD 9, he has HPO ontologies. He has, and we can mix and match the selection of patients across these very widely different ontologies. And the power of I2B2 here is saying we do not need one ontology under God to actually do this. We can use the different ontologies as appropriate for the test. We had an automation in the connective tissue. Now let's look at doing a query of looking at all the patients that have connective tissues, uh, tissue and there's 412 PCA concentration counts, and to look at all the potential variants of interest, so to do a phenotype to genotype approach. So it's really, depending on the use case, it's not one tool that fits all. It's really a question of, it's creating a modular open source stack where you can have different use cases based on what you want to do.
And I said, Chinook, I, I've literally seen this nowhere else. The ability to fluidly grow across, fluidly grow across clinical data, research grade uh, annotations, as well as genomics. And they're all in the same playing field and they're all uh, combinable with the same Boolean uh, techniques. And they're all exportable to uh, third party packages that you prefer. Here's the, meta here's the metabolomics, for example. And this is, this is the full precision medicine stack that we've all been waiting for. And it's, it's here, doable, and available. And to look at the difference of the creatinine level between those groups. So there's not a statistical difference of the creatinine level between the patients with um, a, a connective tissue issue versus the other ones. So it's to, to it's really to generate hypothesis, not to run the, the user phase, is to explore and see if it was right in line or not. Okay. Rudy, I'm gonna ask you to help me get back to my PowerPoint thing. This is my personal Chinese channel. Whatever it says, believe it. Slide your next one, next slide. Yeah, that one. Thank you. Rudy, I really appreciate it. All right. Uh, there. Okay. And so that was the user for interface. And you'll be hearing later today about uh, new user interfaces from the user interface uh, group that's led by Griffin Weber. But in the nerd world, in the, the world of building new applications on top of this data, having usable APIs is gonna be important. And I'm very pleased to tell you that we actually have full APIs, the picture API, that allows you to go in, and I'm just showing you bits and pieces. This is using a Jupyter Notebook, but it could be whatever authoring environment you want. And here it shows that you're generating uh, basically R code that allows you to create specific data frames using uh, the, uh, uh, the package called Cupcake, R, R Cupcake, uh, that allows you to speak in picture um, web API and shown here, for example, allows you to select on age, on gender, on a particular gene. And the full richness of the ontologies and the complexity that you see in the real world, not the very tiny complexity that we see illustrated by uh, just the genomic query tools, like for instance, where the uh, GA4GH has focused, but this is the full complexity. That is available now. You can actually write in your Jupyter Notebook or your programming environments, API calls that gets all that data. And in fact, Paul ran a hackathon at Harvard where we had multiple teams using this API against real live data. Uh, for those of you who care, this is the uh, reference uh, for, that describes this uh, RESTful API um, through R. It's also important to recognize that there is a rich uh, infrastructure in the slide that I've stolen from Paul. And I want to just point out a few things. One is this, so there's being part of an open source infrastructure, the virtue is you get to sit on, stand on everybody's shoulders. So for example, this piece of infrastructure we adopted early on, which is it's a way of having any programming environment at this point. It used to be just Python but any programming are otherwise in this online notebook so you can have reproducible research and that plugging it into our I2B2 Transmart platform allows us to have this reproducible framework. Having uh, these, diff these different uh, web services allows us to scale, whether it's in Azure or Amazon or IBM Cloud or Google platform. Docker gives us the ability to um, be much more portable. But interesting things I never heard of like Splunk, we in healthcare focus on all sorts of auditing tools. Splunk works on 
terabyte a day log files for big companies. And we can use those same tools to actually do high performance, detailed profiling of who's looking at what and to not use industry standard tools and just have to reinvent it for medicine is the same kind of foolishness that we've seen with the, in the EHR industry. And we don't have to do it again. Also, having, uh, oh, and similarly, there's a uh, poll showing you the genome uh, browser for uh, looking at genome, but we can also use other open source projects. And Paul may or may not tell you today about working with the Broads, Hale uh, Spark powered uh, genomic uh, variant repository allows us to work at scale of tens of thousands of genomes quite scalably and efficiently in our same uh, I2B2 framework. Also, you can actually, if you have your institutional data and you want to create a separate repository of your genomics, you can use smart fire apps to actually look at clinical genomic views of the same data um, to be able to get your clinicians of a integrated view. This is the only way in the near future you're going to get an integrated view for clinicians at genome scale. Yes, you can probably get some single variant reports in EHRs. You're not going to get whole genome views with the EHR other than through this. Um, also, I want to point out that there's been something very valuable called dbGaP, and this is its growth in use, exponential growth. The problem is it's become much more, it started becoming much more of the Roach Motel, which is you could put data into it, but it was hard to get data out. Uh, it's a bunch of studies and you'd have to ask for each study individually and get IRB approval for each study individually, where most of the studies you want to have were across this. Moreover, unfortunately, because it's a small team at NIH, it's become worse than the Roach Motel. You can't even go in. So now there's a, it's like a bad day at uh, Chicago O'Hare. You have a bunch of studies that are trying to get into dbGaP and are staying for months or even years without being deposited. And so as a result, there's a big NIH push now for something called the Cloud Commons. Create a place where all of us as researchers in a decentralized way across multiple cloud vendors can share data. And Paul will or will not talk to you today about how we're using the picture API to and I2B2 to access and organize data to these various uh, cloud implementations. And we're part of the big cloud commons projects we're, we're helping mediate. Last, I'm just gonna tell you that we are also using this, this technology to drive patient or people powered medicine. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is we can probabilistically link data across multiple data types, but just because we can does not mean it's either legal or ethical. And so we've started a project, um, an outgrowth of our BD2K project, where we're consenting patients to allow their data to be merged from Fitbit data, genomic, environmental exposures, um, the Twitter feeds, and we're doing it to uh, uh, cohorts starting, uh, we've started already, and we're enrolling patients in autism, and exceptional responders to uh, cancer therapy. And um, I, I'm running out of time, and so I'll just touch upon this. What we're doing, we're, we've created a toolkit to allow you to create a registry that's driven as much by social media and web-based applications to recruit and consent individuals to allow joining up both extra institutional and health uh, care data and give full autonomy for patients to repurpose their data. We already have the infrastructure in our system so that from day one you give the you donate data to this uh project you can immediately get it out as a json file not just as a pdf so it can repurpose the data as structured data for any other system and here's an overview uh, this is more of an organizational overview but you see that as led by our advisory board which has a lot of patients we have these participants we measure them on all these omic as well as non-omic uh data types we shove all their data into a data lake, fire formatted, link it to a bunch of exp exposure data from the environment, and then shove it into an analytic platform. Guess what? That analytic platform is I2B2's Transmart. And from there, we can return data to patients. From there, we can uh, make the data available uh, for researchers. And 
this is a I don't want to uh, so I just want to say about our one thing about our uh, network for enigmatic exceptional responders is the cancer arm it's a collaboration with pharma we have both patients coming directly to us at Harvard like in the undiagnosed disease network but also coming in through the pharma arm to be recruited to be part of this uh, uh, study and I urge you to go to the to WBUR to look up this um, this study. See, shown here is one of those our exceptional responders who happens to be a member of the Harvard Catalyst uh, staff, also on our in the Office of Diversity, who was diagnosed two years ago with pancreatic cancer, was given a year, I'm uh, sorry, given one month to live, and now two years later uh, did the marathon. Um, and I urge you to go look at that story. And I want to just point out that this infrastructure would have been impossible without, without the accretion of all these open source tools around the platform that you are hearing about today. And so with that, I'll thank you very much. And I'm not sure whether or not there's time for questions. Gil, I guess there is a time for one, at least one question. That's right. And because of that, because when you do mass spec, you find zillions of mass charge ratios, and some of them are with associated with known genes, but with functions that are not fully understood. Some are associated with proteins who are not known at all. I think linking them to these clinical uh, features is going to be what's important. But I think we need some proteomics leadership to do that, and we'll talk to you about that. Any other questions? I know I threw a lot at you. In that case, on with the show.